morning. Um, One second, okay. Dr. Hayward, I will I'll set it off for you. Okay. Right now. okay, so hello, my name is Kristen Talbot and I am the program coordinator for the Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and thank you to our friends at Cherokee Health for hosting today's session on evaluation and treatment of seizures in children and adolescents with Dr. Hayward. Dr. Jean Hayward is a retired child neurologist with 31 years of community hospital-based practice, including resident and medical student teaching. She led the child neurology department, bringing the number of child neurologists from two to 14 during her time as chief. Dr. Hayward particularly enjoys teaching families and providers. During her practice, she was awarded the Karis Award for demonstrating compassion for her patients and teaching this to the providers with whom she worked. And now she volunteers for the Maven Project. So again, thank you, Dr. Hayward, for joining us today. And it is all yours. Okay, great. Well, good morning. Um, this, morning this morning, we're going to talk about seizures, uh, which are pretty common in kids, uh, in less common in adults, thank goodness. Uh, many children will actually outgrow their seizures or their tendency to seizures. Um, so let's dive right in. I have no disclosures uh, in terms of any kind of... Uh, affiliations with organizations that uh, influence my commentary. When a child has a change in their behavior, uh, the first thing to ask if you're contemplating seizures is what is a seizure? Um, and so a seizure is a, a clinical or a you know, physical or mental expression of an abnormal neuronal discharge from the cerebral cortex. Um, they're usually intermittent, they're usually self-limited. Most seizures are quite short, uh, often less than a couple minutes. Um, and they can either be clinical where you see something or the, the child feels something, or they can be very subtle or even subclinical where it's hard for people um, around the child to even detect that a seizure is ongoing. Um, there are seizures that are considered acute symptomatic, and these are seizures that are provoked by some event. Um, most commonly in kids, that's a febrile seizure. So the child has an illness has a fever greater than 101.5, and then has um, a seizure. Uh, it can also be associated with head trauma, um, drug ingestion, um, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, unprovoked seizures occur randomly, you know, whenever. Um, and depending on the seizure and, or epilepsy type, these can sometimes be predictable when they're gonna occur, but sometimes they really are quite random. Um, and in, in inquiring as, with the history, you, you will, find that there should not be a consistent uh, provoking event that set off the, this spell. And epilepsy, uh, which is different somewhat from seizures, is a state of recurring disposition to recurrent um, seizures. The de definite of epilepsy is often clinically considered to be um, more than two or two or more events that are thought to be seizures. So one seizure does not give you epilepsy. Epilepsy is relatively common. Um, it happens anywhere between 0.5 and 8 per 1,000 person years in childhood, childhood being defined as under, eight, under 18 years of age. Um, ooh, there's a big typo. Um, point, about up to 1% of kids will have a, a single afebrile seizure by adolescence, but that doesn't mean they have epilepsy. Um, three to five percent of kids will have febrile seizures, um, which occur at age less less than age five, and thirty percent will have of those children will have more than one febrile seizure. But these are provoked seizures, so they're not considered epilepsy. Of those children with febrile seizures, however, up to six percent can go on to develop epilepsy. Um, and uh, so families who have children with febrile seizures will often ask, you know, will my child have epilepsy for life? And the answer is statistically probably not because it's only up to 6%, uh, but it's, it's definitely good to at least keep that thought in the back of your mind for that child's future health. There are different types of epilepsy and the schemata that classify epilepsy are uh, long and complicated and uh, don't necessarily change what you're doing in the moment. Uh, we do, however, classify epilepsy types um, because it helps us sort of know where we're going. It knows it helps us pick what medications to give or not give, um, and it helps us counsel the families. So if you classify by seizure type, you can say that there's a focal seizure with or without impaired awareness uh, with motory, sensory, or autonomic changes. Um, and these can or 
or may, may or may not progress to a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, which is very obvious. Generalized seizures uh, originate and have rapid spread to involve bilateral brain networks, and they are often associated with altered mental status, um, but may not have a, a fall to the ground or a change in uh, physical uh, you know, well-being. So even though it's a generalized seizure, the child may not fall to the ground. And then there are some types that have continued to defy neurologists, and those are con considered unknown or unclassified. Um, and a, a common, common for child neurologists uh, example of that would be epileptic spasms or infant infantile spasms. If you look at infant of epilepsy syndromes, which are different than epilepsy uh, seizure types, um, that's a category that helps you categorize again where you are and where you're going and what you're going to treat. So those are categorized by age very often because of age of onset. Neonatal seizures are not always bad, but often concerning. Uh, there are benign neonatal seizures and there are even familial benign neonatal seizures. So the family history will help you tremendously, maybe in retrospect, but nonetheless um, help you tremendously if you have a newborn with, um, new on, with new onset seizures in the newborn period. And if there have been a sibling or a parent who had something similar, probably treat the child similarly without, as if there was not a family history of that, but you will um, hold out hope that that will turn into a, a benign familial seizure disorder. Um, there are also more problematic newborn seizures, so early myoclonic epilepsy uh, or Otohara syndrome, both of which are relatively rare. Um, if you're in the newborn nursery and a child is having seizures, the, the first evaluation always includes evaluation, evaluation of the child for sepsis or infection because that would be the most common cause. Uh, brain injury is probably the next most common cause. And those, but those would be symptomatic or provoked seizures because it is associated with an event. If you look to the next age range up, so infancy to less than two years of age, febrile seizures dominate. And I'm sure you've all heard and seen uh, children with febrile seizures, they're relatively common. There are febrile seizure syndromes that are considered febrile seizures plus that have other seizures that accompany them. Um, but the vast majority of children who have febrile seizures have simple febrile seizures, short, self-limited, um, not a whole lot of excitement um, in terms of other uh, events that occur with the spells and hopefully not recurrent. The earlier a child has a febrile seizure, the more likely they are to recur. And so a child who develops febrile seizures in the first year of life between you know, age six months and 12 months is statistically much more likely to have more febrile seizures. Um, and these do run in the family. There is a epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures and these children have seizures on one side and then the other side um, and uh, it, they recur and are unprovoked. West syndrome we'll get back to, but uh, also known as infantile spasms, but this is important to know about uh, just in terms of identifying these rare uh, children with infantile spasms and getting them to tertiary care uh, treatment right away. There are other syndromes that I've listed here that are all relatively rare uh, in the real world as a child neurologist there. These are the kids that you know, keep you busy day in and day out, um, but hopefully will not um, you won't see many of them certainly in your practice. Dravet syndrome is a genetic epilepsy and it's been wild, widely um, at least advertised recently or included in advertisements because it was the first um, condition for which C oral CBD for children was approved and those people seem to continue their marketing campaign. It's the, the CBD has been uh, expanded for other uses, but again, for rare epilepsy syndromes. Childhood epilepsies and still include febrile seizures. Um, and then there are some benign epilepsies that occur in childhood sort of school age kids. So Paniopolis syndrome, which is benign uh, childhood occipital epilepsy and then benign epilepsy with centrotemporal uh, uh, spikes, which is also called Bex. These are uh, epilepsies that are defined uh, by the age of onset, the type of seizure the child had and the EEG uh, findings and then tincture of time, really. So working over time with these kids and their families, you start to suspect that this is a benign epilepsy syndrome because you've got the age and the EEG and the seizure type already, and then time passes and um, hopefully the kids will outgrow them 
at which point um, you can look back and say, yes, that was definitely Bex, for instance. Um, childhood absence epilepsy is uh, very common as well. Um, these are kids who stop, stare, uh, and are gone, are absent uh, for about 15 seconds. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. And then these other syndromes are um, childhood onset, but also very rare. And again, will hopefully not uh, grace your, your clinics. And then teenagers can still get epilepsy, uh, have the onset of epilepsy. There's uh, juvenile obsonce epilepsy, which is uh, kids who stop and stare, but they can have grand mal seizures as well. And then most importantly, juvenile, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, uh, because this is a type of seizures that develops with the onset of puberty in boys and girls. So girls, you know, between 10 and 13 and boys more like 13 to 16. Um, and uh, is an epilepsy that is often lifelong. So it's important to uh, work with the families around that diagnosis. And we'll talk about that one as well because it's relatively common. So what is a seizure? Well, that's the, where the history really helps you because most kids aren't sitting in your clinic having a seizure. They've had an event uh, witnessed maybe by somebody, maybe not by somebody, maybe they're found on the ground after it's already occurred. Um, and so it's really key in the diagnosis of was it a seizure to go ahead and get as much history as you possibly can. And that often includes calling the school, asking the um, sibling, um, you know, finding the babysitter, uh, that sort of thing. So sometimes it's a, a bit of a work in progress while you're trying to get more information from the people who are not in the office with you, uh, but who may have more uh, information about what happened. Um, you want to know what the patient looked like, what time of day this occurred, um, were the eyes open or closed, um, was there med medications taken or substance use involved, um, it's a chronic problem as we all know in the world we live in and even in kids who swear they didn't that they may not have known they were exposed to some uh, toxic substance. Uh, but it's, it's so for instance if you're if it's after a party for a teenager you have to. Uh, worry about a tox screen. If the child wasn't taken to the hospital, which a lot of times when the seizure's over, the child's groggy but looks okay, and the family doesn't necessarily take them to the ER, so you're stuck with no information from a tox screen. If there was an ER, evalu ER evaluation, it is a good idea to see if you can get that um, that paperwork. And in our current world, I don't know what your world's like, but in the world here in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's multitudes of hospitals and multitudes of um, healthcare organizations and they are more or less interconnected with computers, but not thoroughly. And so you may have to actually call and get someone to get you written information from the, that they read off of a computer rather than be able to look it up um, on the computer in front of you. Family history is really, really important. Um, a lot of these epilepsy syndromes run in families. Um, a parent who you know, recalls that they were given a medication from age you know, five to seven um, and uh, is probably may or may not be unhappy about that concept, <laughs> that, that history, but nonetheless has, was given medication in the past. You may need to get the grandparents on the line and find out what that was about, get them to dig through their records and see if they can tell you what that medication was. Uh, sometimes the clue to the child's seizure is purely what medication the parent was treated with. Um, if you look at people my age, uh, we were only we would only have been treated with phenobarbendilin because that's all there was a, around when you know I was a kid. Um, if you look at people who are you know now in their mid twenties, uh, the list of medications is you know relatively long. It's at least four, if not six, medications long, and so you can certainly get information from a parent uh, about their own past medical history and seizures, if there were them, that can help you decide maybe what this was. Um, cell phones are around, everybody's got one, and very often someone will have pulled out a cell phone and taken a video of what's going on with the child, and those are wonderful. So getting someone to forward you that video is also a, a critical part of the um, evaluation of the child. And then are there past history of, of similar or similar events? So there's that time the child was fall, found fallen out of bed and seemed groggy and didn't get up for school on time. Um, is there a prior history of a, a neurologic condition like cerebral palsy or some kind of developmental delay? So these are all really, really important. And a lot of times this, this is where the history, this is where the answer comes from. This is where you end up deciding I've got enough history, I think it was a seizure, I've got enough history, I think it was not a seizure.
and it is a bit of a work in progress to get all this information. I thought I didn't wake you up and include some Western uh, United States slides, because uh, I think you're in Tennessee. Um, this is Colorado. Uh, my son lived there for a bit, and this is a lightning bolt uh, hitting the mountains, fortunately not too close to him. So in medicine, we love tests. Um, they give us answers. They sometimes give you numbers, um, and they seem like they should be so helpful. It turns out with epilepsy, the tests can be helpful, but they're not always helpful, and they're not always positive or definitively tell you the answer. So for seizures, of course, the big question would be, what does an EEG show? Um, sometimes when you order an EEG, it'll ask you, do you want a sleep deprived EEG? The answer for kids is always yes. Um, we want the kids to fall asleep, therefore they should be tired uh, when they get to the EEG lab. Um, this often involves two adults because one person's driving the car and the other one's poking the kid so they stay awake on the way to the EEG facility. Um, anybody with kids knows that they, they love to sleep in cars. Um, and so you want the child sleep deprived, um, groggy, tired, but not asleep until they get to the EEG lab. The reason sleep is important is that the brain, it turns out, gives out um, brain discharges uh, that uh, can be abnormal, more likely to occur as the child becomes drowsy and then gets into early sleep. And so that's the reason sleep de deprived EEGs are so useful. Um, explaining all this to the parents, even though it takes another couple of minutes, is really, really key because then they understand the reason for their child's um, sleep deprivation and their own sleep deprivation. Uh, because needless to say, if you're going to keep your kid up and only get them four or five hours of sleep, you're going to have to be with them. I usually, I usually suggest that they get a you know, bunch of movies, some popcorn, and they do their best. Um, for a young child, putting them in the bed at midnight and getting them up at 5 or 6 a.m. Is, is generally in, enough to sleep deprive uh, that child. Um, MRIs or CAT scans. We prefer MRIs because of radiation exposure with CAT scans. Um, but uh, some kind of imaging of the brain is uh, generally indicated if you don't know what type of seizure this was. And we generally look for a non-contrast scan for children. In adults, because the concern is more stroke or metastatic brain disease uh, with some kind of cancer, contrast is, is generally the place to start. But for kids, we don't... Um, need the, the contrast so you can at least reassure, reassure the family about that part. And mandated import, reporting is really um, important. You, I would say be sure you know your local rules. Um, in California, it's um, very vague. <laughs> We're the lands of the nuts, the fruits and nuts. Um, and so in California, it's a reasonable length of time, which in the average teenager's mind, of course, is yesterday. Um, in Tennessee, it looks like they've got six months of controlled uh, seizures as uh, documented by a physician, a favorable medical statement, I guess. In <laughs> um, North Carolina, it looks like uh, you have to submit an evaluation to the DMV and uh, have the patient has to be seizure free for six months. So this varies from um, uh, state to state. Um, in Pennsylvania, it was a year. So it, again, it, it it is important for the driving or going to be driving teenager to know that they uh, will need to stop driving. I usually ask them to both in California notify the DMV that they're they're stopping driving and that they're giving up their license temporarily until we get things straightened out. Um, and also their insurance company. If you're not driving, why would you pick our insurance? Um, so that's really really important, and that's where where you work with the family as well to deal with that um, significant disappointment. So back to types of seizures by age. Um, infantile spasms, as I mentioned, are really uh, important to diagnose because you wanna get that child tertiary care promptly. These are children typically um, under eight months of age and usually around six months of age. Um, boys and girls are more or less in, uh, affected the same way. Um, any child who has a genetic condition, Down syndrome or uh, prior brain injury from perinatal uh, brain injury, is at higher risk, um, or a child who has undiagnosed conditions of child's got developmental delay and microcephaly and looks a little different. Um, if the child, the family comes in and complains that the child is having some kind of sudden brief stiffening, either flexor or extensor or asymmetric, um, it's really important uh, to get that child 
urgently to an EEG. Our goal is, is within uh, one week to get that child into an EEG. And, and we try very hard to make it either the same day or the next day. Um, the, th the point behind that is that hopefully the child will uh, do better if uh, treated more promptly. Under five years of age, uh, febrile seizures are more common. You wanna know the temperature. So a temperature of 98.6 does not get you a febrile seizure. Uh, 101.5 is the, the limit theoretically, um, six months to six years. Um, and these children are not usually treated. So that's a very important difference from other children with, with other epilepsy syndromes. Um, sometimes you don't have a temperature, you know, the child was having a seizure, it was quite the panic, the parents, thought they felt warm to touch, uh, put the kid in the bathtub or called 911. Um, at least in the Bay Area, again, when the ambulance guys come, they tend to strip the kids down and put them on a gurney. And even though it's California, it can be quite, quite cool at night here and uh, children are, it's not uncommon for them to arrive on the hypothermic end into the emergency room. And so you may not have an actual fever documented with a number, but uh, parents' fingers are, are worth paying attention to, and if they felt the child was sick, um, felt warm, had a, some sort of illness, um, then you can put that on under the, you know, question mark febrile seizure list and, and wait to see what happen, happens in the future. I mentioned absence epilepsy, which is also called uh, pedimol epilepsy, same thing, different names. Um, these children stop stare um, and have brief less than 20 second blankouts. This is pretty common. It's 12% of all uh, childhood onset epilepsy, so it's worth looking for. And then partial onset epilepsy can occur really at any time in life, uh, in infancy, you know, up to adulthood. Um, and these children will sometimes have a, a, a sensation or a feeling or a, 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 some sort of in their head, knowing it's coming um, kind of event. Uh, and so if you can quiz the child, what happened first? What did you feel? Um, do you remember this spell? Did you smell or see or feel or hear something? They may be actually to be able to give you information, even, even very small children. And then I mentioned uh, JME, juvenile monoclonic epilepsy with the early uh, onset in, in um, or the onset in uh, adolescence. Um, these children can have two types of seizures, actually. They have uh, myoclonic seizures, which are body jerks, which often occur first thing in the morning. And so the parents may not see them because, as we all know, we don't really see our kids, our teenagers, first thing in the morning. They're lying in bed or trying to knock it up or in the bathroom for hours or who knows what. Um, and so it's, you can, again, asking the child, do you have early morning jerks? If you're holding something, does your hand jerk and you drop your orange juice? Uh, you're trying to put your makeup on and do you um, have a, a, a body and hand jerk where you smear the makeup, that sort of thing. And then they can also have generalized seizures, which is usually what brings them to attention. And then the atypical petty malls can occur uh, with the onset of puberty as well. So seizure first aid, this is really, really important because this is something that you can help the family with to give them something they can do um, regarding the, their child's epilepsy or if it happens again. So the first thing is to roll the child on their side. The rescue position, if you look it up on YouTube, because YouTube has just got a, a video on everything, um, it shows uh, a, a person being placed in the rescue position. So they're on their side. Uh, the downside, the down arm is uh, extended above their head and their head is resting on that arm. And then the up side knee has been flexed and is um, tipped forward so that they are uh, leaning on that knee somewhat. And that they'll, if they're not moving, they'll stay in that position relatively securely. Children will very often vomit with seizures and we all, with kids vomit with everything as we all know, but um, it's important for the child to be on their side because of the tendency to vomit. And if you're lying flat in your back and you vomit, of course you can aspirate. So we wanna try and prevent that. It's important to point out to people that nothing should be put in the, put in the child's mouth. There's a, a great uh, old wives tale that is still to this day floating around that they'll swallow their tongue. Your, your tongue is actually fastened to your jaw. Uh, so the base of the tongue is uh, attached to the entire jaw. It can think it'd be pretty hard to swallow your whole jaw. Um, but people love to try and put things in kids' mouths because they're foaming and they're looking bad and they're having the seizure. Um, and so I, I remind people not to put anything, you know, fingers, can openers, whatever, don't put it in the kid's mouth. Um, if they have to do something to help the airway, they can do a jaw thrust where you put the uh, thumbs behind the angle of the jaw, both sides, and then pull forward. And this works wonderfully to open the airway up. It's 
good if you can to write down the time of onset or set a, a clock. Um, in the hospital, of course, we write all over the sheets because we're not doing the laundry, but uh, setting a, a, clock, a timer on a watch or um, noting a time on the clock on the wall is, is helpful just because then you have some clue as to the duration of the seizure. During, during emergencies, time flies by and you have no idea uh, you know, what has happened. I certainly had always had difficulty during a you know, big emergency, even in the hospital, keeping track of the, of the time. So I would be writing on the sheets all the time. If they're gonna call nine for help, uh, call 911, it's important to open the front door. Uh, in California, if you don't open the front door and the ambulance and the fire truck shows up, they'll tend to break it down and then you've got a health repair problem. Um, for children who have seizures that last longer than five minutes, we want the family to be able to rescue, give rescue medications. And this, uh, these currently come as a diazepam, which is called diastat, which is a rectal gel that comes in different doses depending on your weight. Um, and there's also a midazolam that can be uh, administered. Uh, there's a, I think there's a preparation now that's actually a commercial preparation, but it's only indicated for a certain type of seizure, whereas um, diazepam is indicated for any type of uncontrolled seizure. Um, in the past, we used to tell people uh, metal alerts uh, were the way to identify themselves as having epilepsy, but now we all have cell phones and in your cell phone, there is a medical information tab. So if you play with your uh, cell phone, you can find it. You can, um, on iPhones, it's, if you go to your, your contacts, or not your contacts, your, your information about yourself and touch the picture of yourself or the little icon that has your initials in it, it'll open up a page that includes a medical information thing you can fill out. And that will show up on your, um, on the front of your cell phone when you, push the emergency option in the bottom left of the cell phone when your cell phone uh, is locked. Um, on non-iPhone cell phones, you can set up the same option uh, with a little red star uh, app that you can download, or maybe it's on your phone already. So it's important, particularly for kids, you know, anybody kids got a cell phone, if they've had a seizure, even if they aren't done not taking medication, it'd be important to put this information there. Um, for the home, it's important to pull their bed away from the wall because um, if children have generalized seizures at night, they can wedge themselves into a that gap, that tiny little gap between the bed and the wall and suffocate. So that would end, so that would be important to um, provide them with a safe sleeping position. And, and of course, no top bunks for these kids. Um, if they're near water or in water, constant supervision. Um, I strongly recommend life jackets uh, for any child who's prone to seizures, medicated or not. I've had, over the years, I've had several patients who actually had seizures either on a boat or in the water and were fortunately saved because they were wearing a life jacket, which allows them to be, to float. So you can you know, find them. And it has that uh, handle on the back of it around the neck where you can grab the patient. And if it's you know, a good sized teenager, they're, they're not easy to get out of the water. So being able to, to hold them by that loop and the life jacket and then um, you know, pull them to safety is really, really key. And then um, caretakers, school, daycare, babysitter, whoever's around, neighbors or sleepover parents, um, they all should be notified. It's important to have people know uh, the risk the child has if they're at risk of procedures. It's not a big deal. It's not a you know, big thing, but it's important. Um, in California, there's school uh, medication and uh, illness forms that people fill out. And um, we recommend that the family you know, go to the school and pull out the form that they filled out at the beginning of school and update it with the, the new information. So let's talk about medications by seizure type. Remember, as you may recall, I'm, one of the things I had said originally was that if you're um, categorizing seizures, one of the reasons is so that you can pick what medications you're gonna give this child. Um, so if you have a, a child with a febrile seizure, uh, we generally don't give them medication other than consider uh, rescue medications. We do, however, try and prevent the febrile seizures as best we can. And uh, all of us know that uh, over the last year and a half, uh, children have stayed home, they haven't gone to school, they haven't gone to friends' houses, they've worn masks a lot and the number of febrile illnesses has plummeted. I, I think there were so few deaths from influenza last year that it was probably a record. Um, so 
febrile seizures probably didn't happen, happen much over the last year and a half, but now the world is opening up and will hopefully continue to be opened up and um, kids are you know, in communication with each other, probably their masks are coming off and they are likely to have illness and fever. You can't always um, prevent this stuff, obviously. Um, when you go to the emergency room with a child who's had a febrile seizure, the first thing they ask you is, did you give them some acetaminophen or ibuprofen? Turns out this doesn't actually prevent the febrile seizure. So if your child is prone to febrile seizures, you can have loaded them up with all of the antipyretics in the world and uh, likely they're just gonna go ahead and have a seizure. Um, so remind the family that even though they're quizzed on that, it's not because they were expected to have prevented this event. Um, we, however, can look to vaccinations. Um, I know it's a hot topic these days, but nonetheless. Um, so there are, we know that in kids, there are vaccinations we give them, we give them fever. Um, those are live virus vaccines. So MMR and varicella are live vac uh, virus vaccines. They're given around a year of age. They're often given together as an MMRV, and, but they can be split apart. They come as, as separate uh, preparations as well. And so for children who have a history of febrile seizures, I recommend that the MMR and varicella be given about a month apart. And it's been published that this leads to lower overall fever, and therefore that would be a way to prevent uh, a febrile illness that could provoke a seizure. And then influenza vaccines prevent influenza. Um, and so trying to get the child uh, immunized against influenza, which can start as early as six months of age, is also important um, to prevent a, a febrile illness that could set off a seizure. Um, for children who've had recurrent febrile seizures, having that home dose of diazepam, the rectal diastat is important. And um, again, you can look up the dosing uh, online and uh, you know make sure the families have uh, this preparation. It comes as a two pack. There are two syringes in each package. And the reason for that is that if you use one and it doesn't work 10 minutes later, if you haven't gotten help, then you have a second dose to give to try and stop either recurrent or ongoing febrile seizures. Um, school, schools and preschools may or may not administer this stuff uh, in California. It's a big deal because they think they need a nurse to give this uh, medication. Uh, and of course, at home, there's not a nurse, it's, nurse, it's mom and dad. Um, but in any case, um, we can offer it to the schools. I mentioned infantile spasms. Um, again, these are important to diagnose because uh, we, we hope as child neurologists that the early treatment, early diagnosis and treatment leads to a better outcome. So these are young children, typically six months of age. They have a sudden flexor extensor or tensing movement um, of their body. Sometimes you can only just, you can just feel it when you're holding the child. So nothing really moves except you feel the body, the child's muscles tense up. And these kids, kids need that urgent EEG um, with sleep and a referral to the tertiary center for further evaluation. The most common identified etiology is tuberous sclerosis. So a skin exam is warranted. And so if you had a family where you already knew that the parent had tuberous sclerosis, you knew that the child had some white spots, um, which you can see with a wood lamp in children who are, uh, have pale skin, um, then this would be something that you would actually have already sent the child to a tertiary care center because the current uh, plan for children with, with early diagnosis in their first you know, days or weeks of, of life is to actually do an EEG every month for the first year of life in order to pre-diagnose infantile spasms. So the EEG changes from normal to abnormal before they develop the spasms in hopes of treating them very, very, very early. Um, so if you have an infant with white spots on the skin, it's worth um, chasing that down with evaluation of uh, family history, asking the parent, do they have white spots? It, very often the parent may not know that they have tuberous sclerosis, but it's an awesome dominant disease with about a 40% uh, new um, mutation. So the parent, there may not be a family history, but the parent may actually have the uh, white spots, not really think much of them, have no consequences themselves of the condition, uh, but pass it on to their child. So again, very important uh, to examine the child. And, and these white spots are, are very, not too uncommonly pre-diagnosed. They've already been diagnosed by someone who's seen the child for their whale checks, and then the spasms develop, and then the whole story sort of falls together. But we try to uh, get a diagnosis sooner if we can. 
Childhood absence epilepsy, as I said, is really common. We, we don't necessarily, necessarily even do MRIs for these kids. So you get the EEG, which is abnormal, showing a three per second spike in wave. Um, this is provoked by hyperventilation. So they have the child uh, breathe, either breathe hard or blow on a pinwheel. Um, and, the, and it sets off a seizure, actually. Uh, the, the seizures can also occur spontaneously during the EEG. Um, and so that's, if the child's the right age and the EEG is perfect and the history of the, <clears throat> of the spells is classic, then the child doesn't necessarily need an, EEG, an MRI because the MRI will be normal and then it's a waste of time and potentially anesthesia, money, et cetera. <clears throat> These children are generally normal. So they're, they themselves can actually tell you, well, not much because they don't remember it, but some of the really some of the kids who are really tuned in will tell you that they recognize that they missed something. So the teacher was reading a favorite poem, for instance, and the child realizes that they've missed, you know, three or four sentences. So you can ask the child if they missed anything or if they know what happened, but they may not. Um, if children are inattentive, they may look the same. They may look like they're not paying attention, that they're staring uh, blank, not paying, you know, checked out. Um, and so that's uh, the differential diagnosis for absence epilepsy is that this child actually has a behavioral problem or ADD or potentially um, ASD, autism spectrum disorders. Um, and then if you think that there's other seizures, types involved, so there's myoclonus, body jerks, or there's a warning beforehand, then that would not be absence epilepsy. And the EEG um, would also help you in that it would be either normal if the child had some of the type of epilepsy or show a different pattern. If a child is less than four years of age and you're suspecting that the child has um, absence epilepsy, it is important to, again, have this child evaluated through a tertiary care center because there is a very rare, um, GLUT1 transporter deficiency that is coded for genetically that can cause absence epilepsy with a very early onset, so typically less than four years of age, um, that can be either autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive or sporadic, but nonetheless is treated differently. These children have a low CSF glucose, um, which used to be how we would diagnose it until someone got clever and figured out the gene. Um, and are treated with a ketogenic diet, actually. So it's a, it would be a very different treatment. So for the very young onset child who has a classic EEG for absence epilepsy, um, uh, further evaluation with genetics and tertiary care neurology is, is warranted. This is an example of the EEG for a, a child who has absence epilepsy. And the, at least on my right-hand side, you can see that there are these you know, very well-organized spike and slow ways that develop where here's the spike and then here's the slow wave. And up here, you can see better the spike and the slow wave. And these are three per second, one, two, three. Um, and on the video portion of this EEG, you would presumably see that the child had stopped with staring, might be smacking their lips or uh, clicking their tongue or maybe blinking a little bit. Um, and this usually lasts less than 20 seconds, so usually 10 to 15 seconds. When treating these kids, which um, would be perfectly within the uh, purview of, uh, uh, of your clinic, I think, uh, you would start with ethosuximide um, and it's 250 milligrams twice a day for the average child. If you have a very small child or a very young child, uh, you can dose by milligrams per kilo per day. Uh, ethosuximide is really used only for um, these type of seizures. Um, so if a family says, oh yeah, when I was you know five to eight years of age, I took Zorontin or ethosuximide and I don't remember much more about it, you can presume that the parent also had a childhood uh, absence ep epilepsy. Um, there are the medications that are used. And so there's a whole list below um, and there are medications to avoid. So there are medicines that, that carbamazepine, medications will actually provoke the seizures, make them worse. And most child neurologists have, you know, without an EEG available, thought that they could get this right and given carbamazepine at least, you know, once to a child with child absence epilepsy and discover to make them worse. Um, about 12% of kids uh, will have grand mal seizures. Oh, another typo. Um, grand mal seizures that 
come with their abs onset epilepsy, we usually let them have one. So if you have childhood abs onset epilepsy, you're taking Zorontin, you're seizure free, you have a single grand mal seizure, we'll leave you be. If you have more than one grand mal seizure, we need to change medications because it turns out that ethosuximide does not treat grand mal seizures. Uh, and, but again, it, not that common in children with abs onset epilepsy. So it's something to know about, but not to worry about. And then the most common side effects are headache or stomach ache um, and decreasing the dose usually helps. It's rare that you have to stop this medication. Um, and, and so it's worth working with the family and the child to sort of get through uh, if there is a stomach ache or a headache. Um, and we don't do blood monitoring. Uh, so that's good for the kids. Now you've treated the child, your seizures are gone, they're tolerated the medication, life is carried on, school is going well. Um, they do have, a, these kids do have a slightly higher chance of having reading-based uh, learning difficulties, but um, most of them do fine. So again, they're usually quite normal kids. And so now it's been a couple of years and you try and figure out, okay, am I ready to stop the medication? Because when to start and when to stop are always the big questions. Um, so if, you're, if the child is seizure-free for a couple of years, we usually skip the morning dose of the medication and repeat the EEG that day. Um, this doesn't actually need to be a sleep deprived EEG because this is not a sleep associated epilepsy. This is a hyperventilation provoked epilepsy. Um, and you look to see what the EEG shows. If the EEG is normal and you've missed one dose of medication and the ch child has had adequate attempt of hyperventilation during the EEG, then you can try and wean off the medications and see what happens. <clears throat> There are sometimes focal sharp waves, so not generalized like we just saw in that picture, but focal sharp waves. And that doesn't um, necessarily mean that the child still has epilepsy. These are sometimes sort of leftover brain discharges that we see in kids with petty mal. Um, if your EEG still shows the three per second spike in wave, then we usually put the kids, can have the kids continue their medication and reevaluate every one to two years um, as time passes. If the child continues to have seizures and abnormal EEGs and need for medication as they get into teenagers, uh, teenage years, and it looks like they're not outgrowing their, their absence epilepsy, then a consideration of changing the medications to lamotrigine for female patients should be undertaken. And the reason for that is that is if you think a child's going to turn into an adult with epilepsy, you want to be thinking way to the future as to how the medication that you're prescribing could affect a pregnancy. And Zorontin is not considered uh, something you really want someone to take during pregnancy, whereas lamotrigine is considered safer. This is Alaska. One of my sons went surfing in Alaska this summer. Uh, turned out it wasn't as cold as it sounds and they had a good time. Other types of epilepsies also occur in childhood. Uh, most epilepsies occur in childhood. And if you look at adults and you say, do adults get epilepsy? The answer is yes, but it's often this, the, the curve is, starts up again after mid early twenties is when the childhood uh, epilepsies numbers fall. And then there's a big gap between early twenties and then old people. And then as you get into your sixties and heart disease and stroke and tumors and this and that comes on again, then the seizures um, uh, start up again. So there's a, a real big gap in adulthood. So if you have an adult, a 30 year old with epilepsy, it may well be that they have childhood onset epilepsy and they still have epilepsy. So partial onset epilepsy is um, uh, partial onset. It starts in one part of the brain and is often symptomatic of whatever that part of the brain might be. Um, and is more likely if the child has a CNS abnormality. So these kids, kids definitely get MRI, MRIs. Um, EEGs can be normal um, in, in kids who have partial onset epilepsy. And so a normal EEG doesn't mean the child doesn't have seizures, it just means the EEG is normal. Um, about half of kids with childhood epilepsy will have partial onset epilepsy. So this one is also relatively common. Some of them will have had um, focal febrile seizures in childhood. Um, and so that history is important. And the chance of them outgrowing the seizures is important to know because you start treating the child and caring for the family and you're gonna to have to remind them that the chance of remission, so growing out of the seizures is only 40% for childhood epilepsy, uh, onset epilepsy with partial features. As opposed to for absence epilepsy, it's up in the 80% range. The family history might be relevant here, but is often less helpful. 
after uh, the second seizure, you're going to uh, start treatment. So the first seizure doesn't give you an epilepsy diagnosis, but if you've had two seizures, it will. Um, that EEG, as I said, could be normal or focal and may or may not correlate with uh, you know, what the description was. So the description was the child had a, a focal shaking of the right arm, and you may find that the EEG shows right-sided brain discharges, which but it should really, if it's supposed to be from the right arm, it should be a left-sided brain discharge. So the EEG doesn't always help. Um, we usually give levetiracetam to these kids um, and see if they tolerate it and if it helps their seizures. It's a, a mild drug with a big dose range, which I've listed below. Um, and the side effects are often uh, what is the problem. It can cause mood behavior um, kind of side effects, although it does not impact the appetite typically. The dose can be ameliorated, can be changed to ameliorate these side effects uh, with benefit for some kids, and sometimes vitamin B6 uh, can help as well. And then I mentioned earlier the benign Rolandic epilepsy uh, with central temporal spikes or BECs. It used to be called Rolandic epilepsy because the area of the brain that the brain discharges come from is the Rolandic area. These are sleep associated seizures. So that may not be nighttime because children, as we know, sleep other times of the day as well. Uh, but the child is typically asleep. Um, and there's a prominent hemifacial motor component that can spread to a generalized seizure, but may remain as a hemifacial motor control component where the child has jerking of the face and drooling and weakness of the face um, and partial loss of consciousness. Um, the, these spells are typically quite short and are often um, unpredictable in terms of how often they occur. I've had families who didn't want to give their child medication and would bring them in spreadsheets with the, you know, details of over years as to when and how often and how long and everything that their child's seizures um, had occurred. Uh, waiting, I'm not sure for what, but waiting to decide that they were ready for medications. Um, we typically give these kids medications if they've had enough spells to be problematic. So one spell a year doesn't count, two spells a year doesn't count either. Um, on the other hand, um, if you're having monthly seizures, uh, most families are interested in medication. Um, and we give them medications at bedtime because these are um, sleep associated seizures. So if you're treating them successfully at bedtime and they're driving to the beach one day and have a seizure when they fall asleep in the car, um, we would usually leave that alone and not change anything because the target of the medication is nighttime and this child was, had fallen asleep during the day. So we just leave that alone. We'll move on to juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which is, a, as I said a, earlier, a teenage uh, puberty onset uh, disease. It's uh, autosomal dominant, and so it is relatively common that a parent will actually have a, a JME as well. Um, they may not have a great uh, opinion about their epilepsy. <laughs> as, as everybody knows, the stigma of epilepsy is not wonderful. Um, and <clears throat> I've certainly had many parents who were affected by JME, <coughs> excuse me, and were not um, happy about it. Um, that attitude affects their kids, unfortunately. So it's important to work with the parents if they have JME to help them move forward so their child can see their own diagnosis as a more positive thing. I mentioned earlier, they have early morning myoclonus, they can have generalized uh, tonoclonic seizures and sometimes have absence seizures where they stop and stare. Their EEG is diagnostic as well. So this is a, a time when an EEG helps you tremendously, just like an absence epilepsy. And these kids have a four to six instead of three. Uh, hertz polyspike and slow discharges so that you're you're looking for that in the report if the person who read the eg didn't include that information what's the frequency of the um the discharge then you might even have to call back and say could somebody look at that eg again and tell me you you know those generalized discharges that you saw are those what's the rate four to six you know is that so you can get that information and again these kids usually have a normal e MRI, although we do MRIs typically for this group. Um, the chance of remission is very low, 20% uh, or less. Um, and so these kids often need lifetime medication. Uh, valproic acid works very well. Uh, however, in uh, women and girls, <clears throat> we tend not to use the valproic uh, to, to treat them for JME because they're likely to be on this for a lifetime and valproic is the most teratogenic of the anticonvulsants. And so we will treat them with any 
anything else, uh, preferably lamotrigine, um, in order to uh, prevent exposure of a potential pregnancy to valproate. And then driving again is um, on hold until uh, this all gets straightened out. Can you outgrow epilepsy? That's what the families always ask you first thing. Uh, when my child has epilepsy now, when are they gonna outgrow it? It depends on the type. So that's where having categorized the seizure type is gonna be useful for, for you and for the family. The febrile seizures, yes, pedimal epilepsy, very likely. JME, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, um, probably not 20% is the chance. Um, and maybe for other types. Uh, a child who has a uh, brain lesion, so an abnormality of the brain structure would be less likely to outgrow their seizures. And then the big question again, when to taper off medication. In general, if the child has been seizure-free for two years, we uh, reevaluate to see uh, where they are and discuss whether we're ready to stop medications. Um, if the child was 14 when the seizure started and they're 16 now, uh, and they want to drive a car, they, the child and the parents will have to consider, should the child stay on the medication and get off to driving or uh, wean off their medication and delay driving for at least six months um, in order to be sure that they're seizure free and are driving safely. Um, and then obviously taking the child's uh, other history into um, account is important. So um, a young child uh, who's not driving uh, it's much easier to wean the medication off, find that the seizures are still there, put the child back on medication, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then obviously if there's a, a lesion or a brain abnormality, that's important to take into consideration. So our approach to epilepsy includes a really, really good history that sometimes is a work in progress as you're gathering more information, basic labs, which can include an EEG definitely and an MRI maybe. You would consider treatment after a second unprovoked seizure. Really important to have that first aid discussion with the family, including having the kids load information into their cell phones and notifying the school. And then working really hard on compliance with medication um, because that's really the, the name of the game. And for the child who's gonna have a lifelong epilepsy, uh, compliance is something that's really gonna be important for their uh, long-term future. There is uh, community information and epilepsy foundation in every community. It turns out there's actually, I think three or four epilepsy foundations in Tennessee. I thought that was interesting. California has one for the North and one for the South, but you guys have one all over the place. There's several of them. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Ayord. So if anybody has any questions, you can put that in the Q and A box at the bottom or raise your hand and you can, uh, I will unmute you to ask orally. There's something in the chat, but I can't see what it is. That was me. Oh, that was you. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Oh, we have one. Okay. So the question is before six months, is it not considered a friable seizure? Febrile seizure, right. Yes. Um, the a formal definition from us little child neurologists is that febrile seizures occur from six months to six years of age. And so um, if you have a five month old with a fear of 102, who has a seizure, that child should be thoroughly evaluation for other causes of seizures. So brain abnormalities, tuberous sclerosis, um, et cetera. Uh, it may be that over the next couple of years, you decide that that really was a febrile seizure and the child has you know, a febrile seizure uh, disorder. If the child has a febrile seizure at five months of age, uh, it would be a child who's li very likely to have more. Uh, but so, the evaluation would be undergoing. Um, the child would not necessarily be treated with medication until you decided, did they have epilepsy or did they have febrile seizures? Um, and time would, time would pass and the answer would, would come to you, I think. So you could put it as a question mark febrile seizure, but should really embark upon an evaluation for does this child have an epilepsy syndrome or a, um, a brain lesion, that sort of thing. Great. Anyone else before we close out today? I'll give it a minute. Yeah, I'll show you a beautiful picture of Yosemite. <laughs> uh, at the very top here, this is the Lyell uh, gr Glacier, which unfortunately, given the drought and the climate situation in the world, uh, has been downgraded to an ice patch. <laughs> 
from a glacier because it doesn't have enough <laughs> permanent uh, water in it and ice in it to qualify for a glacier. But this is a Yosemite uh, in, up in the highland of Yosemite, not down in the valley. Anyway. All right, Dr. Hayward, we have another question. Um, do you mm -hmm. have any advice on transi transitioning teenagers from pediatric to adult neurology at age 18? Um, yes. Uh, as many of us know, children who are 18 are not really adults yet, even though legally they are. Uh, and so it, there are, if you look online, I think you'll find that there are uh, forms that you can try to fill out with the, the child. So really any child with a chronic medical condition who's going to transition to the adult world um, needs to have, you know, information about their condition. They need to have, you know, probably written and printed out on paper, uh, what their diagnosis is, what their medication name is, um, what they uh, have been through in terms of medications that they reacted poorly to or whatever, because a lot of kids may not remember this stuff. You know, they were just rolling with the punches and their parents, you know, maybe still been a fog. Um, and then to try and transition them, uh, for, and, and, and for women, uh, birth control is, is a key part of this. As a, as a child neurologist, you know, the majority of the medications we prescribe are teratogenic. And so hopefully uh, and a, a young adult who is taking a, a anticonvulsant is taking lamotrigine, which is felt to be the safest available for um, pregnancies. But it's really, really important to work with these women about maintaining um, some type of birth control not stopping their medications um, and transitioning to an adult neurologist and probably a perinatologist so they can plan a, a safe pregnancy. Um, so giving them, so we, we have a form that we actually fill out for the patients online, and, but also give them a copy of that includes all this information. And then we try very hard to transition them to an adult neurologist who sees young kids um, uh, you know, who sees young adults and, and likes young adults, <laughs> not, not, not all adult neurologists like young adults. Um, and then in this, again, in this day and age, counseling about alcohol and drug use, alcohol can provoke seizures as we all know. Um, and, uh, and so someone who's already prone to seizures has epilepsy should, you know, be avoiding drugs and alcohol. And that's again, a conversation that you need to have with the patient. Um, so that transition is often, something you can sort of see coming. We, we would typically start around age 16, uh, working on that transition, working on um, asking the, you know, the kid comes for the visit with the parents. You say to the kid, okay, so tell me what medication you're taking. And then the parent opens their mouth and you say, no, 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 not you. Have the child, have the young adult, tell me, the, the teenager, tell me what medication you take and how much and what size are those pills? How many milligrams? Um, show me your cell phone medical information. Show, you, show me how you get to it. Um, so all that stuff is part of that transition, which, you know, you can see coming because they're getting older and older um, and something to work on because you want the, the child to be able to advocate for themselves. All right, Dr. Hayward, we have two more questions and then we'll uh, finish out. So the first one is with anti-epileptics, how often would you obtain lab work, CBC, CMP, et cetera? Um, it, depends, it depends on the, on the medication. So uh, for levetiracetam, we don't get blood tests. Uh, for Zorontin, we don't get blood tests. Uh, topiramate, uh, sometimes if there's complaints of, of side effects, it can, it can induce some mild acidosis. Um, for valproic acid, uh, it's every six months for a child who has been on that medication chronically. Um, and um, when you're just initiating the medications, it's usually sooner. So within a month and then um, three to four months later, and then eventually after a year uh, of treatment, then you can go to the every six months routine and that's liver enzymes and CBCs and Depakote levels. The reality is, is that most of the blood tests I order for my patients on anticonvulsants are related to either side effects or uh, suspected lack of compliance and breakthrough seizures. Um, and so um, getting uh, a level of the medication at whatever time of day, uh, either a peak or a trough or at the time of an event is what we do the most is to see what, what is going on here. Um, and non-compliance is, is very common as, as we all know. Um, so there, like for a child on lamotrigine, I would say a CBC and a lamotrigine level once a year if everything's going great. Uh, but more likely you're going to be getting levels because there was a breakthrough event and you're trying to see what's going on. Okay. Next question is, and I apologize if I say this wrong, okay. is agmas common in seizures? 
Mm, what was the first word? Nystagmus. Oh, nystagmus. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so the at the beginning, I said, you know, get in the in your history, get the history of the eyes open or closed. So the the trade secret here is that during most seizures, the eyes are open, and so a child who falls to the ground in the middle of the concert when her you know her performance was supposed to be occurring and has eyes closed has probably fainted. Uh, a child who has eyes open uh, and is staring blankly and unresponsive, it would be more likely to have a seizure. Um, so nystagmus, so the eyes are open, so you could see the nystagmus and there are children who will have uh, nystagmus often driven in one direction where the eyes are beating to one direction um, can occur with a seizure, of, very often a focal seizure. Um, and so that would be something that you can see. Sometimes all you see is the nystagmus. The child's are, eyes are open staring and the eyes are beating in one direction and that, that's all you see for a seizure. So that certainly can happen. Okay, last question and then we'll close out. Um, how often do you check drug levels assuming a patient is controlled? Yeah, so if they're well controlled and they're not taking Valproid, then, um, and it's a medicine that has a drug level that's useful. So lamotrigine has a drug level that's useful. Topiramate and levetiracetam do not have helpful drug levels. Uh, they, don't, they don't correlate with much. Uh, so if the child is taking a medication that you can get a level that means something, uh, then it would be annually. If it's Depakote or valproic acid, then it's every six months um, for mo more for monitoring the, of the CBC and the liver enzymes. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Hayward. We are at the, the top of the hour. Um, again, this session is, re is being recorded and it will be posted on our website within a week or two. Um, and everybody will receive a copy of, our, uh, of Dr. Hayward's uh, slides. And thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Enjoy your days.